Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, I hopefully you'll find this presentation useful and interesting. We're going to review the gamut of the most common motor problems in Huntington's disease. Uh, my name is Rajiv Kumar. I'm from Colorado. I'm uh, very pleased to be presenting with my uh, friend and colleague Kathleen Shannon, who's from Madison, Wisconsin. And I'm going to take the first half and we'll do a little introduction to the uh, sort of uh, what are the main motor symptoms of Huntington and where does that fit in. Uh, and then I'll speak uh, more specifically mainly about Korean Huntington's disease. And then Dr. Shannon is going to focus in on Parkinsonism and dystonia and Huntington's disease. And we'll be also speaking more about juvenile Huntington's disease, so those, since those are the predominant motor problems in juvenile HD. So uh, all of you are aware of all the uh, disclosures we have. And if you've been to any of the other sessions, you'll know that uh, HDSA would like all of you to give some feedback on the sessions. So please uh, take out your camera for a quick sec take a picture of this uh, or scan this QR code so at the end of the presentation you could provide some feedback and tell them how much uh, we did terribly and how it should be improved for next year, okay? So here we go. Okay, so uh, all of you who are attending today's convention are very familiar that HD is associated with three major domains of problems. One is motor problems, which we'll focus on today, cognitive problems, which typically occurs gradually in the prodromal phase and progresses into the symptomatic phase with difficulties with the multitasking and executive functioning followed by more widespread cognitive difficulties. Behavioral problems can be very problematic, especially depression and apathy, but irritability, psychosis, and other uh, psychiatric problems can occur. And unfortunately, because of difficulties with management of motor problems, suicidality is not uncommon. And then, of course, the most common and prototypical movement disorder involuntary problem is chorea, and I'll be focusing quite a bit on that today. Now, HD is interesting in because there are problems both with voluntary and involuntary movement problems. Amongst the involuntary movement problems beyond chorea, as I mentioned, is dystonia, which refers to twisting and turning movements, often with sustained abnormal postures, rigidity, or stiffness, something the examiner might feel on examination. It's hard to passively move a limb, for example. Spasticity, which is another form of increased tone. And myoclonus, which are quick jerk like movements that are more common in younger patients with HD, especially those who might have epilepsy, too. Now, amongst the disorders of voluntary movement are Parkinsonism. And when I say Parkinsonism, I don't mean Parkinson's disease. I mean elements of the findings in Parkinson's disease, such as slowness of movement, which is bradykinesia, and rigidity. Tremor is relatively uncommon, but can occur in Huntington disease. Decreased coordination or ataxia is well recognized, and that contributes to some of the gait problems patients with Huntington's have. Poor balance also, of course, and falls can be a major problem as the disease progresses. Speech and swallowing problems, as you know, can be very troublesome and can contribute, of course, to communication difficulties and weight loss. Motor and persistence is an interesting phenomenon whereby patients have difficulty sustaining an action. So a classic uh, example of that is if you go to shake the hand of someone with Huntington's, you ask them, okay, just keep squeezing my hand, it may have various lapses in ability to sustain the same sort of uh, pressure, and we call that a funny name from ancient times called milkmaid's grip. And eye movement abnormalities, initially difficulties uh, initiating movements, and then as the disease progresses, the movements become slower, and the person with HD may have difficulties obtaining the extreme of range of motion up or down or right or left. Now, many of you have probably, since you've been here for the last couple of days, have become familiar with the newer ISS staging system at Huntington disease. And you can see here, let me see if I can get this pointer to work, aha, we can see that we have a pre-symptomatic stage in which an individual is gene positive but has no evidence of any abnormalities that we can detect either on examination or by imaging or blood or CSF uh, findings biomarker positivity, whereby somebody has imaging findings or might have other uh, fluid biomarker positivity. Stage two, whereby the patient is still independent in day to day activities, might have some cognitive or behavioral problems, but is still independent, but has some findings, often motor symptoms of Huntington. And then stage three is when this patient who is still functioning well begins to lose uh, uh, independence and becomes increasingly dependent on help in day-to-day -day activities. So this is the newer staging system in HD. And as I said, we're going to focus on motor problems. And it's quite interesting that if you carefully look at somebody in stage one, 
in the biomarker stage, before they're aware of symptoms or it's very apparent that they have findings on examination, you can see that if you carefully measure their speed of movement, for example, finger tapping or their walking, and, or look for their ability to sustain a specific position and so look for subtle chorea, you can actually measure that there are subtle findings on motor findings when you do it quantitatively even several years before the patient becomes aware that they're, and the examiner actually becomes aware that there are actually symptoms on examination to find. Now, we're going to focus mainly now on stage two and three, and I'm going to focus mainly on chorea. And chorea occurs in a high percentage of patients with Huntington disease. Uh, more than 90% of patients will eventually develop chorea. And when I mean chorea, I mean random flowing movements or quick jerk-like movements, which are um, not predictable. Right? They vary from body part to body part. They vary in vector. And initially, when mild, may look just like fidgetiness. And uh, they typically, typically may begin distally and spread, for example, in the fingers to more proximal body parts and involve the face also. Now, most involuntary movements that we see in neurology are worsened when an individual is stressed, either physically or emotionally, for example. And so if somebody is asked to, for example, do arithmetic, that may stress them and that may worsen their chorea. So let's take a look at some examples of chorea here, and we'll start with some mild chorea here. So these are all patients of mine uh, who have been uh, examined. This is a patient you can see, he's doing finger tapping, and you see he has emergence of facial involuntary chorea, and I've got him sitting up here and doing some arithmetic, and you can see that he's developing twitchy movements in his feet or lower extremity chorea while counting backwards. This patient has not only these lower extremity movements, but also you can see he's got truncal shifting movements. So this is milder chorea involving different body parts. And here's a person who had just began to become symptomatic, and so she mainly has chorea in the distal fingers. Let's look at, uh, again, as the disease progresses, more severe chorea. So we'll do a mo look at moderate chorea now as some examples. And you can see this fellow has reduced facial expressivity, and just like the other person had fa facial chorea, but now he's got tongue chorea. We're getting more substantial truncal chorea and shoulder chorea and even some facial abnormal movements, and this patient you can see has more substantial upper extremity and, and truncal abnormal movements, and she even has some abnormal posturing or dystonia intermixed with her chorea. And this fellow you can see has more substantial distal chorea than we saw earlier. We saw this patient earlier, I upset her a little more, and so the lower extremity chorea becomes more marked than we saw when we examined her earlier in the day. And this person, you can see, his chorea comes out when he's doing other movements. So he's doing pronation, supination tasks with the hands. And then lastly, let's see more severe chorea as the disease progresses yet further. And we can see this patient has predominantly facial chorea and truncal chorea. This person also has, and we saw him before, but now I've exaggerated by having him do finger tapping, and he's developing more facial chorea and tongue protrusion. And this person we saw before, again, I've given, I've now stressed her and she's listening to me, and she's developing these truncal arching movements, right? So it's a combination of the posturing plus abnormal movements, and this person develops large amplitude flinging movements of his limbs, and he can't even speak, actually, because of facial chorea unless he holds his chin, uh, because the facial chorea may interfere. And even just talking to me, you can see his legs are really bouncing. So these are some examples of chorea affecting different body parts and of different, different severities. So you get an idea when I say flowing or, or uh, movements, et cetera, what I'm talking about. Now, chorea often presents early in the symptomatic stage, tends to worsen through the mid-stage of disease, and usually, but not always, tends to become less when patients develop more advanced disease. And often it's replaced, as Dr. Shannon will speak about, with more slowness of movement or Parkinsonism and abnormal posturing or dystonia. And we saw individuals had predominantly distal hand chorea, but we also saw chorea as it progressed to involve more proximal body parts. Now, chorea by itself is just a phenomenon, but the question is, how is it affecting the individual, their care, and, and the like? So it's important to ask. Not all chorea needs to be treated. Not all chorea is troublesome or disabling. But it's important to ask, is it interfering with typing, feeding oneself, participating in, in activities that are it's important to them? Is it throwing them off balance? Is it causing falls? Is it interfering with work performance? 
Is it affecting driving? All of these things are important things to consider when deciding whether or not to treat and how to treat an individual. And when it's more severe, individuals can fall down and get hurt. They can hit their limbs against other things, and this can contribute to self-injury. And of course, if the chorea is causing falls, it may be hard to care for that individual. It may contribute to the need for nursing home placement. Now, chorea, especially when somebody is highly functional, is in, the, is in the workplace, or in social situations, can cause a big source of embarrassment. And that itself may be a driver to need treatment. And of course, the person caring for them may be affected because it's harder to care for somebody who's having more disability due to chorea. Now, it's very an interesting phenomenon. There's a funny word that's used in neurology called anosognosia, which really means that someone has lack of awareness of a deficit. So some patients may have less awareness of the chorea and say, oh, I don't have chorea, or it's no big deal, but it's very obvious to the family or the physician that the chorea is very troublesome, maybe causing them to fall down or maybe spilling. You may be talking to them, and they're eating, having a snack, and the snack is going everywhere in the exam room. And there's nothing wrong, they tell you, but obviously there is a problem. So sometimes you may have to integrate what the patient tells you, what the family tells you, and what you observe to decide is there a need to treat. So let's take a look at just a couple of examples of how Korea might impact somebody. Let's just take a look at a couple. So this person we're seeing, she's trying to put on my lab coat. And it's a big, too big, of course. But, but you can see she's, because of the Korea affecting her trunk and her, her hands, she's quite slow in just buttoning. These are very simple, large buttons to do. So it's impacting her manual dexterity and slowing her down in day-to-day -day activities, such as dressing. And then let's see, some, let's see one more example of a day-to-day -day activity. Let's see somebody, this fellow walking. We saw him earlier in some of the other movements. And you can see that he's just walking. He's just trying to walk along the line, not necessarily walk heel to toe, but you can see the he almost falls down there when he's turning. And you can see the excess movements of his limbs and hips. And his stride length is pretty good, but it's not it's his, the regularity of his of his, uh, of his uh, stride is not, uh, is not exact. So just some examples of how chorea may impact somebody. Now, sometimes it's good to actually hear patients speak for themselves. So here's a couple of examples of my patients actually talking about how chorea affects them. So we'll, so we'll hear from Candace here. Let's see how that... So if it'll run, we'll see. Hmm, what's happening? It's spinning here, that's not a good sign. Okay, well, you might have to escape and try it again. You don't want to speak. Oh. All right, just a moment here. Okay, of course, I've got the, uh, we're going to close that program and we'll try restarting the presentation in just a moment, excuse me. You guys don't see all the error messages that I'm seeing here. Just a moment here. Let's see, a moment, hopefully we'll get to work. Well, while it's coming up, we'll hopefully get this to restart in a second. I will start talking a little bit about treatment of chorea, and hopefully I'll be able to get this to work in the meantime. And it looks like we're getting there. Well, we'll try one more time here. Okay, let's see if we can get this to work here. We'll try one more time here. Okay, go back one. Let's try, let's try this one. We'll try can you cut your own food, or do you need help with cutting the food? I need help cutting my food. Once it's cut, can you feed yourself? Yeah. Will you spill because of the chorea? Yeah. Does the chorea affect your speech? Yeah. Tell us about that a little yeah. more. That's a part of it. <laughs> so you make some funny sounds. Is that right? Yeah. And do the I call it my singing. So that's Amanda. She used to work full time as uh, an accountant and a bookkeeper in a hotel. Uh, she has five children. She's an incredible mom. Uh, and even now, even though she has very advanced disease, uh, her chorea is, you'll see in a moment, is very severe. At times, initially, it responded extremely well to medicine. She was unable to drive, but actually could go back to driving as a result of good treatment of her chorea for a while. But then you can see now that her Does it affect really your walking and balance? Walk. Yes. Tell us about that a little bit. I have to, I have an inside walker. 
and then an outside walker because my Korea is pretty <laughs> insane. Here she has so the Korea makes you fall down? Korea yeah. Too. And so let's try just one more brief. Let's see if we'll How does Korea otherwise this impact you? Does it, affect, uh, does it affect using the scissors when you cut hair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Have you cut somebody accidentally because of a Korea? Cut myself. Does it make you sloppy? Do you spill mm -hmm. when, you cut, when you cut food yeah. or you feed yourself? Mm -hmm. And if I go to reach for a drink, I will um, knock it over because I like, can't judge the distance to grab it. So I'm constantly <laughs> spilling things. Uh, does it affect your walking or balance? A little bit on my left side right now. Have you fallen down because of the uh, Huntington symptoms? Not recently. Have you in the past? A couple times. So it's interesting to hear how patients um, notice how it's affecting them, and that's very important. It's important that we pay real uh, strong attention to what patients tell us. So there are a variety of medicines that can be used to treat chorea. The ones that are FDA approved are the dopamine depleters or so-called VMAT2 inhibitors. The first one is tetrabenazine, and these medications inhibit the transport of dopamine from the, uh, from the cell to the uh, what we call the synaptic vesicle, and this results in re release of dopamine, but when this is inhibited, you release a synaptic vesicle that doesn't have much dopamine, and so it doesn't promote movement. And so this can slow somebody down, and the first one that was approved is tetrabenazine, a modification called dutetrabenazine. It goes by the trade name Osteto, and recently the Huntington study group performed a large-scale study of valbenazine, and which, is, which goes by the trade name Ingreza, and this is before the FDA for approval. So all of these medications show very useful improvement in Korea, but they don't get rid of all Korea. And in general, our goal is to reduce Korea, not get rid of it all, because if we do, we're more likely to be over-treating an individual and actually exacerbating slowness or Parkinsonism. We often will use medicines that block dopamine, so-called antipsychotic medications, and there are two main types, ones that have stronger blockade or typical antipsychotics. These have more side effects, especially sleepiness, for example, associated with them, okay, but they're more powerful, such as haloperidol and flufenazine, and atypical ones block both dopamine and serotonin receptors, and common ones are risperidone and olanzapine. These not only can help Korea, but can be helpful for mood, especially irritability and sometimes depression or psychosis. And if somebody has really bad chorea, we'll often use a combination to try to suppress the chorea even further. Now, for some patients, they will not respond adequately to these things, or they have relatively mild chorea, but it's beginning to be bothersome. A relatively inexpensive and fairly well-tolerated medication is a medicine that in the past had been used to prevent the flu and is used more commonly in Parkinson's disease, and that's a medicine called amantidine. It works totally different than these other medications, not on the dopamine system per se, but on the glutamate receptor, blocking a receptor called NMDA receptors. There are a variety of other medications for which there's very limited data, small case reports showing benefit, and sometimes when patients don't respond to any of these, we'll, we'll throw on one of these two to see if we might get adequate improvement. And once in a while, there can be a little bit of improvement idea, uh, indeed. Now, for patients who have severe refractory chorea that's not responding adequately to these treatments, we will consider a surgical procedure where we implant electrodes in the brain, hook up the electrodes to a pacemaker-like device to block abnormal signals to reduce chorea. So for severe disabling refractory chorea, uh, DBS can be helpful. One of the problems is that there is some data that suggest it may worsen cognition. There, the data on that is pretty variable. One has to be sure that one doesn't cause excessive slowness, however, also, or worsen gait or other, uh, other motor problems when doing deep brain stimulation. And obviously, deep brain stimulation is not without risks because you're operating on the brain. Now, I'll be happy to take more questions later, but I'd love for my colleague, Dr. Shannon, to take over now, and she's going to speak next about uh, Parkinsonism and dystonia. So I'm going to bring her on. Dr. Shannon, come on up. There we go. Hi. Can I be he heard all the way back there? No? Okay. So, uh, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, some other movements that we see very commonly in Huntington's disease. And when a person kind of learns about Huntington's and first starting pa seeing patients, one of the most remarkable things is that we would think 
if you have a disease that's progressively getting worse, that all the same things that you had in the beginning would progressively get worse, and that's how the disease would progress. But when you start to see patients with Huntington's disease, you realize that there's a definite change in the appearance of patients over time. And it's very baffling to our medical students and to our residents sometimes. So that's really what I'm going to talk about. And the two movement disorders I'm going to talk about are dystonia and Parkinsonism. Um, so uh, dystonia is dystonia is a hyperkinetic movement disorder. It's an involuntary movement disorder, as Dr. Uh, Kumar mentioned, uh, and it's different than chorea. So chorea is kind of fast and kind of random and kind of flowing. Dystonia is a slower movement disorder. It's a more twisting movement disorder, and it's more patterned. So it has a, a kind of a repetitiveness to it that chorea doesn't. Um, and so often there's this kind of twisting movement um, or directional, the move the limb goes or the body part goes in the same direction all the time. And Parkinsonism, what's called an akinetic movement disorder, so loss of movement. So that means they're stiff and they're rigid and they're slow and they're walking as slow and they take small steps. Um, and uh, Dr. Kumar mentioned this, tremor is a prominent part of Parkinson's disease, but it's rarely, I've only seen one case of a resting tremor in a, in a Huntington's patient, so kind of a typical Parkinson's tremor. So um, we're just going to talk uh, about adult onset Huntington's disease, then briefly at the end we're going to talk about juvenile onset Huntington's disease. That's often not given enough attention at these meetings. Um, and in adult onset Huntington's disease, that's where you see that progression from the person is kind of clumsy and then has abnormal eye movements and then they develop chorea and then the chorea gets worse and then over time the chorea tends to get a little bit better and be replaced by these other movement disorders. And who knows this fabulous woman here? Everyone know who that is? Nancy Wexler? So th this is data. I'm just going to show you one data slide. So um, there was a remarkable family or collection of families in Lake Maracaibo, Venezuela, so a very poor fishing area uh, where that was the, the occupation of the residents. And uh, there were hundreds of patients with Huntington's disease. And so um, uh, Dr. Wexler organized a study where people went every year and they examined all the people at risk, all the people who had Huntington's. And so this is where we really learned in exquisite detail how Huntington's disease starts, how you evolve from normal to early Huntington's, how it progresses, and how the movement disorder changes over time. And so um, what I want to show you, so this is a little graph. So this is um, what's called a total functional capacity. So it's a measure of disease severity. 13 is normal. You're able to work and manage your finances and take care of your house and take care of your family. And one or zero, you can't do anything for yourself, can't feed yourself, often require nursing home care. So this slide shows you from mild to severe. And each of these bars is a different thing. So dystidokinosis is clumsiness, abnormal eye movements, the dark bars are chorea, these hashed bars are Parkinsonism, and then the checkerboard ones are dystonia. And um, so this red is the Parkinsonism. So you see as the disease gets, and, and this, this height of the bar is how severe the problem is. So you can see over, as the disease gets more severe, there's a really pronounced increase in Parkinsonism. I'll show you the chorea bars, which are increasing for a while, but then they start to decrease at the end, so a little bit less chorea. And then the next one is the dystonia bar, also showing from mild disease, the dystonia is mild, and then as the disease gets worse, then the dystonia gets worse. You can see over time that while the chorea gets worse and then gets better, the dystonia and the Parkinsonism fairly consistently get worse. Um, so back to dystonia, I'm showing you a still picture because um, uh, to show you the kind of posturing. So there are postures in, in dystonia. Here's a foot posture and a hand posture in this cartoon. And here is a Huntington's patient, just a still photo, showing a very typical dystonia posture. Now I'm going to show you some videos. So I, I don't have my videos aren't as nice as Dr. Kumar's because his were professionally recorded and ours were, you know, not professionally recorded. So um, this is a man who has mid-stage Huntington's disease. You're going to see quite a bit of chorea, and then what you're going to see also is he's got dystonia. So at the same time, he's got quite a bit of chorea, so he's on that, on that previous, uh, uh, oops, that previous bar. He's over here. You know, he's got a, like a total functional capacity of around four, and he's got, still got a bunch of chorea, but he's also got uh, some dystonia. Um, so... So here he is. So he's got these really kind of large amplitude, what, what on Dr. Kumar's presentation would be considered moderately severe or severe chorea. He's still able to walk, but this interferes with lots of his activities. Um, so most of what you're seeing is kind of random. It's not always the same movement. 
uh, they're fast, kind of flickery movements. There's a tendency to flow down the limbs. That's kind of very typical Korean. Towards the end here, after he turns, what you're going to see is dystonia. So now you've got a slower, more sustained, more twisting posture. You see how that's different than the jerky and the fast stuff? So he is the combination. So in mid-stage disease, you get the combination of the movements. And then as the disease progresses, you often lose a bunch of Korean and get more of this. Um, all right, so this, um, this is a cute story and it's a dystonia. So one, one of the issues that we have when we see patients with Huntington's disease is, is someone comes in with chorea and a negative family history, absolutely no family history. And I learned from a colleague this name, family album tomography. So you're all familiar with what a CAT scan is, computerized axial tomography. So this is what he called family album tomography. So get the videos from the family and see if you can see any evidence of Huntington's disease. So this is the, uh, the video, the family album tomogram. It's a wedding. The woman in the, I want you to pay attention to the woman in the, in the blue dress right here. That one. So she's being helped down the stairs. So there's a sense that maybe she's got a balance problem. So we're very interested. She's the mother of the patient who came to see us with Korea. And now she's, this is a different video of her and she's in this, um, the flower dress here, and you see when she moves her hand up, she's got a little bit of this kind of Korea form movement, a little bit of that random movement. And then when she stands up, what you're going to see is that she has quite prominent dystonia. So she's got posh, she's got a posturing of both arms when she stands up. So this video helped us to make the diagnosis of Huntington's and see how that arm posture. So that's not Korea, that's dystonia. That makes sense to everyone? You got it? Okay, good. Um, so, so that's dystonia. So dystonia is a slower, more twisting, more posture-y kind of movement. The next one's Parkinsonism. And Parkinsonism comes from, a, from appearing like Parkinson's disease. So slowness, stiffness, trouble with walking and balance, usually small steps, for example, uh, in the walking. And first I'm going to show you a, a later stage Huntington's patient who's got dystonia and Parkinsonism. So that's this guy. So he's in a nursing home. And um, you can see he's got a problem with his pa He can't sit in the chair properly, which is actually a part of Parkinsonism too, this inability to just keep your posture in that upright uh, condition. He's got, his movements are slow. He's got some movements of his face, but they aren't that kind of flickery, rapid movement. They're more sustained, so those I would call dystonia. That's Gina, my nurse, my old nurse. And when he stands up, you see this dystonic posturing. So these are postures, the wrist is turned in, the shoulders shrug up, it's not that fast chorea, it's a dystonia. And then he has terrible trouble walking and he takes these little tiny steps. So he has prominent dystonia and Parkinsonism. And so late stage Huntington's patients, and any, anyone with Huntington's the family has seen late stage patients are more akinetic or Parkinsonian. Now I want to talk just briefly about juvenile onset uh, Huntington's disease, mainly because they don't usually have chorea. They don't get chorea. They have dystonia and Parkinsonism, and they also have seizures and myoclonus, which you heard about briefly, but I'm just going to use these as illustrations of uh, dystonia. So this is a young girl who's, at the time she got sick, she was five actually, she's about 18 now, or 14 now, and at the time her father was not sick but had a family history of Huntington's disease, and she developed problems in school. And uh, it's hard to even know that the tape is running because she's really quite slow, although there are some Korea movements of the fingers here, this kind of piano playing movement. But it's, um, you see when she stands up that she's quite dystonic and she's quite slow. And so the finger tapping here, this is a good way. So you know you can all tap your fingers pretty fast and this is as fast as she can tap her fingers. Again on this side, so. And you're not seeing really any Korea at all. And then when she stands up, she's got these fisted postures of her hand, so that's dystonia, and a very short step length. So this is Parkinsonism, slow walking, short step length. Uh, so that's fairly characteristic. And, and later, after she became ill, her father became ill with adult onset Huntington's disease, which is a common pattern in this uh, juvenile Huntington's. I'm going to show you this. Uh, this actually is the son of the nursing home patient I saw you. So his father had late onset Huntington's disease, typical, and was late stage at the time the son presented uh, with behavioral changes, uh, picking on his sister and not, not wanting to go to school. Uh, and uh, he had this family history of Huntington's disease, so that's why he came to see me. 
And uh, you're not seeing a lot of Korea here. You saw it's still a little bit of flicker of the fingers. So he's, this is the, I'm showing you two videos about four years apart. So you can see the progression of this dystonia Parkinsonism in a juvenile case. So he's not quite as slow as the last patient, but he's slow. I mean, a healthy person, a teenager, would be able to do much faster movements, obviously. No Korea. He's a little, he's not so much, he's a little bit uh, uncoordinated, what we would call ataxia. Um, and mo mostly it's a kind of a slowness of the fingers and hands, not so much of the walking and balance. And so then we're gonna see his next one several years later. And you can see, of course, not much. Look how slow he raises his arms up. So this is, again, Parkinsonism, the slowness. He's got some posturing of his hands, which you could call dystonia. And again, very, very slow movement. So this is a juvenile onset Huntington's with very prominent Parkinsonism. That makes sense? You see that? See the difference? Okay. All right. So, um, and this is really, we're going to have plenty of room for questions here. So the reason this is important is that when, when we are treating patients with chorea, with the, with the medicines that Dr. Kumar told you about, the medicines that reduce dopamine or block dopamine, those movements slow people down. And so that's why it helps the chorea. But if you're already slow and you already have this dystonia, they aren't particularly helpful and make, can make things worse. And so it's important for people to recognize that Huntington's is a complex motor disorder. It's not the same motor disorder that just gets worse, the same but worse over time, but it changes in a way that can really cause problems if you don't reevaluate the medicines. So over time, uh, dystonia and Parkinson's evolve and may completely take over the motor picture. And so it's important to, for, for us to do surveillance and to pull back on these medicines, these anti-chorea medicines, when um, people develop uh, Parkinsonism in particular, um, especially the antipsychotics and the, and the VMAP2 inhibitors, the tetrabenazine, dutetrabenazine, valbenazine. Uh, there are approaches to treating dystonia and Parkinsonism. I have tried using Parkinson's medicines. doesn't particularly work well. Occasionally, someone will get better. Um, uh, but mainly, I've tried it in the juvenile cases rather than the adult cases. Uh, I did a study with it once, and in the adult cases, it actually made Korea a little bit worse, so um, we didn't really use that. Um, we have had people who had very pronounced dystonia uh, who we did deep brain stimulation surgery on. Uh, we have pub published case of deep brain stimulation surgery on a, a man who had terrible torso dystonia. Uh, that was helpful. So it's, it's a lot of problem solving at that point, so looking at the patient, seeing what the what the sources of disability are and then trying to fix them. Um, all right, so now we have time for questions. I'm gonna invite Dr. Kumar back up here and then we have uh, 15 minutes. Yeah, we were asked to leave 15 minutes for questions, so yes. Well, the story of the South America story, that's a very poor area of South America. And um, they're believed to all be descendants of the same person who was there hundreds of years ago. And in, it's in these poor places, people don't move out because they're poor. People don't move in. And so you get this kind of concentration of that genetic abnormality. And that's the group where the gene was discovered, actually, because everyone had that same you know, inheritance from these ancient like ancient ancestors, not ancient, but old, much older ancestors. But you find Huntington throughout the world in all ethnicities, right? whether it's in Asia or Latin America, Europe, Africa. It's less common, though. It's less in common the, in certain areas. It's mostly sure. European yeah. and less common in non-European. Yeah, and it, for example, in the United States, its prevalence in, in black Americans is roughly proportional to how much white blood has been mixed into the, to the population um, from our terrible history in our country of slavery. But, um, so I, I have few black patients. How many, do you have a lot of black patients? No, well, I mean, and a I'm in a fairly homogeneous part of the United States, just like you are in the Midwest, rather than being down here, we have a much better and greater diversity. But yeah, we have a, we have a couple of 
of African-American families, and indeed in the United States and in Africa, if you see, if you see individuals actually uh, who, who are of uh, black ancestry and they test negative Huntington disease, there are some Huntington disease phenocopies, especially what's called HDL2, which is a mutation in another gene called junctophilin. Uncommon, but definitely that's, an, that's a more of an African gene that causes a disease similar to Huntington disease, very rare disorder. I have one African. I have one African patient on Huntington's an African immigrant, uh, full, full blood. I think there's a lot of variability across the landscape of Huntington's disease within, I mean, if you have your own family issues, some people have more Korean, some people have less Korean, some people have more behavioral changes and less behavioral changes and more cognitive changes and less. I, there is a general tendency to move in that direction, but I think there's quite a bit of variability. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Huge variability, even within a family, even within people with the same CAG, repeat, like, yeah. it's, it's very, it, there's no two HD patients who are the same. The motor we'll give you the mic. Oh, the, the, you thank you. Yeah. The deep brain stimulation affects the motor disorder or impacts the motor disorder. Does it have any impact on cognitive or behavioral <laughs> things beyond that? And second of all, what are the criteria for DBS? Yeah, I would say, I would say there are no developed criteria for uh, DBS in Huntington's, and it can be quite the uh, convincing job for an insurance company to pay for DBS for Huntington's disease. But um, it's it's it targets the motor stuff, but it can have side effects. Both in it, most most DBS is done in Parkinson's patients actually, and it can have cognitive side effects in those patients, and it can also have cognitive side effects in Huntington's patients. Um, and I've only had the experience with the one. How many? Very few. Yeah, less than it's five. it's a very rare, it's a very rare intervention. Yeah, it's really reserved for those people who do not have an adequate response to oral medication, and where that is clearly uh, disabling, and the risk benefit ratio because of the potential cognitive side effects is worthwhile, and we're clearly going to have an improvement in quality of life for the patient. So all of these things need to be taken into account. So if you have, for example, somebody who has a lot of chorea, but they're already wheelchair bound, already because of cognitive problems, may not be able to manage day-to-day -day activities, if we reduce their chorea, are we going to improve the quality of life? So that's a long discussion with the patient and the family, right? Where is uh, in doc, perhaps the patient of Dr. Shannon's, the patient's having a lot of pain and abnormal posture and can't walk and is cognitively not doing okay, if we were to improve that patient's dystonia, we could improve their quality of life. So there's a, there's a lot of discussion that needs to be had, absolutely. And, and then one thing to think about if you're treating chorea with deep brain stimulation is remember that the chorea is gonna tend to become less for many people and, then, and it won't do necessarily do anything for the, uh, for the dystonia and the Parkinsonism. You mentioned the Parkinsonism, and the examples you showed all seem to be more juvenile. Is it possible to have that as like the first movement disorder without any chorea or anything else? I've seen it in some people who are young-ish, so I have a couple of people in their mid to late, so juvenile Huntington's is uh, under the age of 21, basically. Um, and uh, by definition, just a definition. But I've seen people who are in their 20s, mid-20s, even inching up to the late 20s who had Parkinsonism as dystonia as their prominent movement disorder. But that's not very common, honestly. I can't tell you how uncommon. 90% of people will get dystonia eventually, but it's not, it's not a very common. And I, I've, I've only seen it in people who were in, that, in their 20s or juvenile. Have you seen yeah, it in Yeah, I think that's people? true. Yeah, I think you see somebody who's in, in the mid-20s who CAGs in the mid-50s. Yeah. That's the kind of patient, and that, that same patient could have presented a few years earlier, uh, you know, and would have been considered juvenile, and uh, yeah. so. Looks like there's a question here in the front. Yeah, she's a uh, kind of similar question. I was wondering if the transition from chorea to dystonia tends to be kind of proportional. Like, if you have severe chorea, are you going to have more severe dystonia, huh? or not necessarily? 
I would say no. I, I mean. uh, the more severe chorea <laughs> patients tend to maintain more chorea in my experience. Uh, it's the more patients who are maybe modest chorea that become more and more dystonic later on. But Dr. Shannon, what do you think? Uh, I, I, think I would hesitate to make any kind yeah, of generalizations about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a more it's, it's anecdote. I don't think it's been well studied. Thank you very much for your excellent talks. So you mentioned that chorea basically stabilizes or goes down along the timeline. So if we look at the other two main symptoms, like uh, behavior symptoms and cognitive symptoms over the timeline, are there other symptoms which basically stabilizes or goes down? Or is it only chorea basically which stabilizes over the time, like time course of the disease? So, um so th there, are, there are a bunch of publications tracking um, changes in our rating scales over time, um, including, so for the behavior stuff, behavior is very variable, probably because it's treatable. So you can, you can measure on the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale, or the t total functional capacity score, that 13-point score, and there's like one, po on average, one-point decline a year, on average. But that's average, so people, there are people who progress at different rates and they may have more prominent behavioral stuff that progresses faster than their motor stuff. I think all bets are kind of off, but the, the psychiatric stuff. So suicidality is interesting because suicidality has certain times when it's higher. So when people are starting to get symptoms but they're not diagnosed, when people are starting to lose their ability to work and they're going to go on and need to go on some kind of you know, supplemental uh, system, a lot of times they'll get suicidality, and then as they get more advanced, the suicidality tends to go. So there's, there's certain things that have patterns like that, and other things are just random. I think the challenge here is that when we say behavioral, as Dr. Shen is alluding to, there are many things that are behavioral. It's like saying there are motor problems. We just discussed several different motor problems. So there's suicidality, as Dr. Shen says, it peaks when people are first phenoconvert or when people lose their, lose, lose their employment. There is depression, which can be very variable. There's irritability, which can be pretty prominent early in the mid-stage, but when patients become very advanced, it becomes less common, probably for the fact that you know it's very hard to strike out and hit somebody when you can't move, for example. You know, that can be a big problem. Uh, and so an apathy tends to be a fairly common problem and tends to progress and becomes worse and worse. So all of these are different sorts of problems amongst in the entire rubric of of behavioral, so I don't. So different. I think there are different problems which peak at different times. Just as you know, Parkinson gets worse, dystonia gets worse. Korea does this. Um, similarly, there are different patterns for different behavioral symptoms in general. But again, a lot of variability from patient to patient. Thank you. So as the patient starts to go down uh, with the chorea and up with the dystonia and the Parkinson's symptoms, do you, do you change the medications at that point to Parkinson's drugs at that point? Okay. Yeah, so a lot of the medicines that treat chorea um, can cause sedation and you know, some issues with cognitive function. And so um, it's important to kind of take away medicines you don't need, kind of re reassess the person, and then try to pull back on things if you don't think they need them anymore. Okay, so the, the, the Parkinson's drugs become more helpful and Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that Parkinson's but, drugs are very helpful. I wish they were. Oh. It's occasionally sometimes. Some, you some remember, remember, better, I but, me remember I left the medication, I mentioned that medicine amantadine. So you might pull back on the yeah. antipsychotics and the VMAT2 inhibitors because those tend to worsen Parkinsonism, whereas amantadine has an antichoreic effect and will not worsen Parkinsonism. It may have a slight benefit in terms of the Parkinsonism. Yes, yeah, so all the Korean medicines, if given to a person with Parkinsonism, will make the Parkinsonism worse. So mainly it's a matter of pulling back on those medicines um, to re relieve that side effect and any other side effects they may have causing sedation or confusion or something else. I wanted to just uh, just have you reiterate one thing. I was a little confused about the visual signs of the Parkinsonism, a visual, the visual that you can see on a patient. So the, this, the videos you thought? Well, the Parkinsonism phase, what visually is it the, is it the twitching of the so, hand? So um, people with Parkinsonism 
we it, test, in, in part of our unified Huntington's disease or any scale thing when we rate patients, it's we have them do rep repetitive tasks, so finger tapping, for example. And so you look for the size of the finger tap, the speed of the finger tapping, and, and for it to ma be maintained. And people with Parkinsonism, they're slow, so the ones I showed you, especially the juvenile ones, they're the easiest to see because they don't have any chorea kind of screwing stuff, making it harder to look at. So their, their amplitude is lower, they don't go as far, they don't go as fast, and then they tend to peter out. That's, that's Parkinsonism in, in, a, in arm movements, for example. And then in the walking, people with Parkinsonism take short steps and they're slow. So the walking overall speed is slow and they take short steps. And then something you can't see but we feel is they get rigidity in the arm. So when we move the arm around, it's not loose. You can feel that stiffness in the arm. So those are, that's how we define Parkinsonism. We have a strong family background of Parkinson's and um, severe essential tremors. And my daughter's positive um, for Huntington's as well. Wow. Is there a possibility that she could develop both diseases? Oh, sure. How would you treat since so she, Parkinson's if, doesn't... If, so if, if, she's, if she has a parent with Huntington's disease, no matter what else she has, she's got a 50-50 chance of getting Huntington's. Right, and she is in early stages of Huntington's. Oh, she's I just wondered, you know, if we get to where okay. she starts displaying Parkinson's, how would they know how to treat it? Or would it all be considered <laughs> <It's> a, Huntington's? <laughs> that is a, it's a hard problem. You find a very good movement disorders neurologist and <laughs> do their best. I can't, there's no. It's, it's, a, it's a terrifically <laughs> terrible, hard problem to treat. Yeah. Um, I, it is, I've never seen a patient who has both Parkinson's and Huntington's. These definitely can occur because they're independent, both environmentally and genotypically. Yeah. It's a little bit analogous to a couple of patients who, I, who we have who have drug induced movement disorders called tardive dyskinesia. <laughs> okay, and also may have drug-induced Parkinsonism simultaneously. They're slow and they have involuntary movements. And I have a couple of those patients who actually have Parkinson's disease too, in addition. That's super hard. So you're trying to use movements to deplete the dopamine to remove their involuntary movements, but you're afraid of worsening their underlying Parkinsonism. And at a certain point, as their Parkinsonism progresses, you have to get rid of the movement, the, the medicines to get rid of the chorea, which is the tardive dyskinesia. It's very similar to the progressive problem. And you're gonna have a really a big push-pull problem at the end of the disease. But it's, it's important to say that Parkinson's disease is not very strongly hereditary. Yeah. So just that, that positive family history of Parkinson's disease is not as worrisome as a positive family history of Huntington's. It's, it's you know, not- We have several members with uh, severe essential tremors. Right. Yeah. Essential is tremor is hereditary. Parkinson's? Parkinson's disease is general, is not usually hereditary, but there okay. is an increased risk of Parkinson's in people with bad essential tremor. But it's not, it's not like, it's not like a 50-50 chance like the Huntington's is. You got to get the volume discount at the movement disorder shop, yeah, right? Totally. Your fam a family discount. Another question about the Parkinsonism: If someone, again, never showed any other chorea or dystonia, but is showing those signs of Parkinsonism, what would be? Do you think the medication contributes to that? So are you saying there's a Huntington's patient who's taking medicine for, what's the, what are they taking the medicine for? Oh, I don't know. So A lot of medicine. Oh, so maybe the person's irritable <laughs> and is taking, so <laughs> the question is if there's, an, so they're not taking the medicine for chorea, but maybe they're taking something right. for irritability and they get Parkinsonian, is that right. what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Well, then that doctor would assess what the potential rest to benefit ratio is. So if the person's terribly irritable and only modestly Parkinsonian, you might shoot for keeping them a little bit Parkinsonian. It's a very individual thing. There's no form, we don't have any formula, unfortunately. Thank you. <laughs> it's all flying by the seat of your pants, basically. And like remember there are those antipsychotics, which are both, which are atypical, which have less dopamine blockade and more blockade of serotonin receptors. We might use more of those atypical antipsychotics in that situation. And there's even a complicated <laughs> medication called clozapine, which has very little dopamine blockade. It's a very good antipsychotic. It has a lot of potential side effects and monitoring requirements, which we'll use in patients who are very Parkinsonian, but they have psychosis and irritability problems. So that could be something to be considered. Again, it's, it's very much a trial and error. Yeah. It's a collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> 
think you guys are all questioned out. We are. I think well, we're we thank you for your attention. We're going to still hang on here for a couple of minutes if anybody wants to come out. Thank you. Have a great convention. Bye-bye.